Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Dina Wachtel with the Canadian Friends of Hebrew University, and together with my colleagues Ayala and David and the rest of our team, it is our pleasure to welcome you to this webinar series titled In Conversation with Ambassador Ido Aharoni, featuring international friends of the Hebrew University. Ambassador Aharoni is a global distinguished professor at NYU who served 25 years at Israel's Foreign Service, a public diplomacy specialist and a well-known nation branding practitioner. Today's conversation is done in collaboration with Sha'ar Shamayim Congregation in Montreal. And for this, I want to say a special thank you to Stephen Lipper, who made this collaboration possible. Stephen is a recipient of an honorary doctorate from Hebrew University, seats on its International Board of Governors and past president of the National Board of Canadian Friends of Hebrew University. Stephen will be concluding our program today. Now to introduce our esteemed speaker, I would like to call upon the Honorable Senator Linda Fromm, a recipient of an honorary doctorate from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, author, journalist, parliamentarian, and philanthropist. Senator Linda Fromm has long been a champion of human rights, interfaith re relations, the Jewish community, and Israel. Please welcome Senator Linda Fromm. Thank you so much, Dina. And it's so nice to be joining the Canadian Friends of Hebrew University today for what I know will be a very, very interesting conversation between two exceptional Jewish leaders on a topic of great joy to us all. And that is the burgeoning friendship and economic trade relationship between Israel and the Kingdom of Bahrain. I have been given the honor of introducing our special guest who will be speaking with Ambassador Roni today. And of course, that is Nancy Kaduri. Ms. Kaduri is a member of the National Assembly of Bahrain and has been since 2010. She currently sits on the Foreign Affairs, Defense and National Security Committee and is the Deputy Chairperson of the Youth Affairs Committee. In addition, this incredibly accomplished woman is also a businesswoman and a historian. In 2007, her book, From Our Beginnings to Present Day, uh, she documented the history of uh, the Jews in Bahrain from its first settlers in the 1880s to the present day. Now, unknown to the committee, when they asked me to do this introduction, I actually met Ms. Kaduri when I visited Bahrain in 2011 as part of a Canadian Senate delegation. And in fact, my most vivid memory from that trip to Bahrain, uh, where we met with the King and the Shura Council, was when quite unexpectedly, a beautiful, charming woman in elegant Western dress introduced herself to me and told me that A, she was Jewish, B, she was a member of the Shura Council, C, she had authored a book on Jewish life in Bahrain, and D, that there was Jewish life in Bahrain. All as Norma surprised me, and it was highly memorable because it was so contrary to my expectations. And so too today we find ourselves in a moment that is also contrary to our expectations, and that is the new peace treaty between Israel and Bahrain. And there is no one better suited to give us insight into this very happy development than Nancy Kaduri. So I'm so pleased now to hand over the floor to her and Ambassador Aroni. Thank you so much, Senator Froom. Uh, this was a beautiful and lovely introduction. And who, know, who knew, we really didn't know that you met her before. What a small world. It shows you that Jewish geography is very, very uh, you know, tight and the network is tight and ultimately we're all connected from Canada all the way to, the Bahrain, to Bahrain. Well, it's such a pleasure to be with you, Nancy. And the first thing I wanna say on behalf of all the hundreds of people on the call, Thank you for taking the time to be with us and tell us about yourself, about your country, and about your heritage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ido Aharoni, and for such a warm welcome by Senator Linda Frum. Indeed, it's been many years, and I do look forward to welcoming you all to the Kingdom of Bahrain in the not-too-distant future, and I look forward to today's discussions. So, thank you. Before we jump into the personal um, discussion, uh, Senator Frum mentioned the Shura Council, which is the legislative body of, of the Kingdom of Bahrain. Can you tell us a little bit about the political structure and what is the role of the Shura? What is your role within the Shura and so on? 
Thank you for your question. Well, um, first and foremost, I'll take you a little bit um, on a historic journey as to how we established a bicameral system of parliament in Bahrain. Uh, the Kingdom of Bahrain gained its independence in 1971. And uh, we established our constitution in 1973. We had a unicameral system at the time that was uh, that included 22 elected members and eight appointed ministers, a total of 30. And this was the very um, how can you say, a short parliamentary experience. Uh, in 1975, it got dissolved because um, there was mounting tensions with uh, fixed views by members and um, they were refusing to pass the government's state-sponsored state -sponsored security law, which would have given the judiciary its independence. So what the Emir at the time did was he dissolved that particular unicameral system and power only rested in the hand of the Amir and the cabinet. After a gap of 27 years, once um, our current king ascended the throne, we had uh, a national referendum where 98.4% of the country voted in favor of an amended constitution, which was in 2002, and that we had brought about a bicameral system whereby we would have two chambers. One was the chamber I'm appointed to, the shura is an Arabic word for consultative uh, council, where we would act as a filter to solve disputes. Uh, we have more of the so-called uh, members who are professionals, like you'd have the lawyers, the doctors, the journalists. So we have more the spe specialists there in drafting the laws. Whereas the uh, Council of Representatives have, uh, you can be just um, with even just a secondary school degree, uh, uh, it's, it's not a problem as long as you're over a certain age and you can read and write, you can be in the elected chamber. So we, we kind of help uh, smooth out the balance. And uh, we are 40 members each uh, now. We are a total of 80 in our National Assembly. Uh, we have um, a chairperson of each council. We have two deputies for each. Uh, we serve, we have various committees. Um, the Council of Representatives, and we had um, a slight amendment again in 2012, we gave the full power of the supervisory and uh, monetary role to the council, to the elected chamber, the Council of Representatives. My chamber uh, continued just to be uh, handling the legislative matters. And of course, we also passed together the national budget, which we have this year, it comes every two years. We have various committees, each respective committee. Um, the name is self-explanatory, like the legislative legal affairs. It, it reviews the, the, that the laws are within the provisions of the constitution. Uh, it looks into uh, removing immunity of members. Uh, the, the actual committee that I serve on, and I served as a deputy for a while, unopposed, uh, foreign affairs, defense, national security. We have all the international agreements coming to us. We look into matters related to um, counterterrorism uh, laws on the safety and security of the country. Uh, we also have the Economic Financial Affairs Committee, Services Committee, uh, Public Utilities, Women and Child, Youth Affairs, uh, and uh, we just a uh, human rights committee and we draft uh, legislations, which is always in the best interest of the people um, and the country. Uh, it is really a privilege to be uh, appointed by His Majesty and reappointed, um, regardless of my religious difference compared to my colleagues as a Jewish Bahraini female. Uh, it's, it's indeed a privilege because when we legislate, we legislate for the country as a whole. Uh, we, we, we work to really improve and reform, uh, reform the, the existing laws. So I hope this has helped to give you a little bit of a, an idea as to how we are today, um, a bicameral system. Thank you so much. This was a very detailed description and uh, this is the time to also uh, publicly thank um, our dear friend, member of the Knesset, Svi Hauser, who really made the introduction, connected us and uh, to our viewers and listeners. Svi Hauser is the head of the Israeli uh, Knesset Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense, uh, and he uh, de facto serves as your Israeli counterpart. 
Um, and, yes, um, and he so is. he's the and one who made the connection. Now, you know, I, yes, I grew up um, in Israel, like many Israelis, like many Israelis, uh, the name Kaduri is, is uh, I wouldn't say it's a common name, but we know Kaduris, you know, there's a very famous school Kaduri in Israel, an agricultural school. I went to school in my high school, there were at least two other Kaduris. And uh, usually we know the conventional wisdom is that the Kaduris originally came from Iraq. Uh, there was one branch of the family that did extremely well in Asia, especially in Hong Kong and, and Shanghai. And so tell us a little bit about your last name, where your Kaduris are from. Are they also from Thank Iraq? You. Yes, in fact, we are. Uh, they are cousins to my uh, late father and late grandfather, the, the tycoon of Hong Kong. They run the Peninsula Hotel and they're very famous. And in fact, they do visit uh, for the Grand Prix each year. Uh, and uh, for, for our side of the Kaduri, uh, my late grandfather originated from Baghdad, Iraq. And, um, and he was from uh, Iraqi father and his mother was of Austrian descent. And uh, he came to Bahrain in the 1930s. Um, his father met uh, his mother uh, years ago when her father opened the Allianz School in Iraq at the time. And uh, when my grandfather started in Bahrain in the 1930s as a trader, he worked with one of the leading families here um, to be partner in the business and later moved on to run his own establishment and became very famous and leading um, importer uh, of, uh, of many items. It was like mainly carpets. We were the first um, uh, family here or the first traders in the country to have the red carpet for the royal family, which they would roll out uh, near the plains and in the palaces, etc. So it was carpet, curtains, garden furniture, and later it moved on to more table and bed linens as well. And uh, my father, once he was much older as well, to help his father in the business, uh, it expanded uh, further. So yes, but both my grandparents are from uh, uh, Iraqi origin. Both but are in the trade as well. But you have some Ashkenazi part in you as well, right? You said this yes, is some Austrian Yes, my, my great-grandma, right. yes, yes. yes. Right. That's all, all right. I know, that, that she would, was Austrian. Yeah. That would, I don't know if you did your DNA, but that would be very interesting to look at the DNA. And um, now yeah. tell us about, try to depict the picture in Iraq in the 1930s. Why did your grandfather move to Bahrain? What happened in Iraq at the time? Um, I, I just was un, uh, under the assumption that the reason why uh, my grandparents came was more in, in a better search of uh, a better quality of life and, and living. Um, and at the time, you know, his cousins told him, come with us to Hong Kong. He said, no, I'm going to Bahrain. So it was really a, a decision at the time and a matter of choice. Um, Bahrain also was known to be an international uh, hub for commerce. And we had many traders coming to Bahrain, even from Europe, from France. They used to come to Bahrain to go to India for the pearl trade, for example, and, and other, um, uh, and other um, um, export, import um, uh, matters. Uh, but my grandfather just decided to, uh, to settle here, as far as I know, as well as the older settlers who came since 1880s as well. You have 1873 to be specific. It was all really in a search of a better quality of life. Uh, uh, Bahrain was known at the time for years and years to always embrace people of various uh, religious and cultural diversity. Um, the Jews of Bahrain were always allowed to uh, practice their religion freely. So I assume he never really felt it was um, a threat to his Jewish identity in any way. And uh, he was comfortable uh, to, uh, uh, to start his life here. Now you mentioned the the first wave of of migration to Bahrain, eighteen eighty or eighteen. You, you mentioned eighteen seventy three. Yes. It's interesting. It's my family came from what is today Uzbekistan to Jerusalem in eighteen seventy four, around the same same time. And the the question is, how many Jews were there in eighteen seventy three, and and how many Jews are there today? Can you describe the little trajectory of Jewish life in in Bahrain from late 19th century until today? 
Um, good question. To be honest, when I was doing the research about my book uh, at the time, it was very difficult to come across the actual statistics. Uh, there wasn't any documented um, exact number as to how many Jewish people there were. Certain researchers would say there was between one and a half uh, to 2,000 people. Other researchers would say there was a bit more over 2,000 at the time. So we're looking in, in, in that range. Uh, to date, of course, uh, since the 1940s, 50s and 60s, families who left out of their own discretion, uh, Jewish people were never expelled from Bahrain. Uh, those who decided to leave, uh, maybe for uh, other purposes, you know, for, for education, uh, for marriage, etc., uh, they left, and uh, to date, really, the numbers are quite small. We're around uh, five, six resident families, around 40 individuals, just under 40. And the age ranges, we have the oldest member who passed away in his 90s a few years ago, got to Seoul. We've got ranging from uh, two to babies, you know, to the younger children. So there is quite a vast um, uh, age gap in, in, in the... Uh, uh, how to say, in the families that, that uh, live here to date. Um, but uh, I would say that those living here to date, third and fourth generation, uh, or second, third generation, they are very um, comfortable with their way of living. You have Jewish people also having their businesses between Bahrain and London, Bahrain and the States, and they travel to and fro and they keep their businesses here. So overall, the number of Jewish people actually throughout the year does vary. Um, and some people who visit out of their discretion, they may not choose to, uh, how to say, like to express what their identity is, to say like, look, we're Jewish or we're here or we're living here. But those who make themselves known, um, you know, we, we, we meet them, we, we, we know of them. Uh, they join us in certain religious uh, celebrations that we have, if it's during that time of year. Uh, but, um, but overall, uh, the Jewish people worked in various professions. Um, you had those working in tobacco, olive oil, um, electronics, ready-made garments. Uh, some were even in the record producing business. Both my grandfathers were also involved in the leasing of cinemas. Uh, some of the Jewish people to date who reside here are in the money exchange business. They have many branches around the country. Um, in the old days, they worked in the petroleum company, teachers, and the Jewish women also worked as midwives or um, uh, sold textiles door to door or were seamstresses. So overall, we have integrated very well in the texture of society. We're highly respected. And uh, we always thank God every day. We say Baruch Hashem for, for the blessing that we have, uh, for the leadership, their wise leadership. Um, and uh, for the wonderful Bahraini friends that we have, regardless of our religious differences. Now, would you say that most of the Jews who live in Bahrain originally came from either Iraq or Iran? Correct. Uh, mainly from Iraq, uh, uh, majority of them from Iraq, Baghdad, Basra, Fallujah. And of course, our dialect at home, the home Arabic is on the Mosul Arabic dialect. But of course, day to day with our Muslim Bahraini friends, we speak the traditional local Arabic Bahraini. Uh, we had a few of them who were originated from Iran, like my book talks about two or three individuals, but uh, there wasn't a larger community uh, from Iran, mainly, mainly Iraq it was. And um, tell us a little bit about the Jewish life in Bahrain, given the fact that you have a large number of, of, of people who go past through Bahrain, but only about 40, 50 people who live there year round. Um, how many synagogues do you have? What kind of, uh, of, of Jewish practice do you maintain in Bahrain? Well, for me personally and uh, my generation, like Jewish uh, tradition was always taught to us by our parents, our grandparents, taught in the home. Years and years ago, when the community was much larger, they did have a shohet available. They had um, like a, a person who would, would lead the community as well. Uh, but, but over the years, we never really had a resident rabbi. We never had that quorum to have a minyan for prayer uh, for three times a day. Prayers would just be in the house. 
uh, we had uh, one synagogue we have, and Bahrain is actually known to be the only Gulf country to have had a Jewish synagogue established way back since the 1930s. It was funded at the start by a French pearl trader who came uh, from France uh, via Bahrain to India. And he felt it was important with the larger community to have a place of worship. So he funded the land, he funded the building, he put the title deeds in the name of um, one of the gentlemen from the community at the time who was working in Eastern Bank, uh, known today as Standard Chartered Bank, just to hold it in trust in the name of the community. Over the years, of course, the building uh, was non-operational uh, and uh, what we had was um, renovation and now it's currently under a second renovation Hopefully by Purim, it will be open again. Uh, benches, we have, uh, you know, title deeds hung up on the wall. It's just like just to show people to have a feel uh, of what it was like. It's in a very old part of town. Uh, Jewish families today live in other residential areas in the country. So um, uh, at the end of the day, the building is still maintained. Uh, and uh, we have a cemetery also that's maintained. Uh, it was never desecrated uh, by anyone, highly respected. Um, and uh, as we say, we're all servants of God and uh, the, the Muslim, the Christian, the Jewish cemetery are all within a one mile um, radius of each other in Manama, which is the capital of Bahrain. Um, and uh, overall, we, we celebrate our tradition at home. Hanukkah is just around the corner. Uh, we had uh, certain delegate, some delegations who visited who wanted to open the synagogue to pray. Uh, last uh, two years ago, we had the Peace to Prosperity workshop. So we had Jason Greenblatt from the White House with Jared Kushner. Well, Jared didn't visit the synagogue that morning, but we had Jason Greenblatt and a few of the others from the Jewish uh, individuals who visited to actually pray in the building, which was a wonderful experience. Um, we also had a few years before that um, uh, an interfaith uh, uh, meeting and we had some of the Muslim and Jewish and uh, Christian friends, they wanted to visit the synagogue and we had a rabbi who visited and he lit the Hanukkah in, in the synagogue premises as well. Um, a Purim from time to time, if there's somebody visiting from Dubai, from the Chabad or whoever it is, they take the little children there and they also celebrate just to have the feel. But usually all the festivals are celebrated at, at home. And this year, due to the pandemic as well, we, we couldn't have uh, the large gatherings that Jewish families are always used to and that, uh, uh, that, that great feel. It was, it was a quieter year this year for all celebrations. Now, you're holding a very important position within the Bahraini system. Your first cousin held a very important position in the United States. I remember her uh, giving a speech at the United Nations General Assembly in September or October of 2006. Um, you know, that brings a question. How come women are doing so well in Bahrain? Um, and tell us a little bit about the status of women in Bahrain and and, and, and what is, is it a, um, is it a common thing or is this, we're looking at two exceptions, you and your, your first cousin? <laughs> well, no, actually we're very proud as to um, the status of women we, uh, uh, in Bahrain. Uh, to be honest with you, it's, it's a subject that I could go on for hours. You're gonna say to yourself, I wish I didn't ask her this question. <laughs> but um, to be honest with you, um, the kingdom of Bahrain is, uh, you know, it took uh, pioneering steps uh, to empower women. Today, I don't use the word woman empowerment. I like to use the word woman advancement because we are beyond being empowered. You know, we've reached advanced stages, as you have just mentioned. My cousin was an ambassador. We're so proud of her role and what she did for the country. Uh, we've had women as ministers uh, and parliament, etc. So we, we really have women in, in a lot of leading roles through the years. So I'll, I'll brief you as to the various sectors and, and you can you know, th know for yourself then um, as to how Bahrain all these years has managed to have women on that pedestal. For example, municipal elections, women could vote since the year 1919. Can you believe that? I mean, so, so many years ago, we had that right to vote. 
The only thing was the uh, was the um, parliamentary elections was with the change of the constitution because before only male could vote for parliament. Now, uh, after 2002, women also could vote, uh, participate in the parliamentary process. When it comes to like, uh, you know, it, it really is to do with the woman herself. If she feels and she's got that determination and she's capable uh, of, of reaching and achieving and wanting that with the support, of course, of the Bahraini male, um, she's able to, to stand as a qualifying partner. Like example, Bahrain women and education. Uh, the first school for girls was established in 1928. And it was a historic event, not just for Bahrain, but for the entire Gulf region. Uh, then we had, um, in 1956, we had the first higher education scholarship for girls, where they were able to travel to Arab countries like Egypt, Jordan, Syria, um, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, and some of them even went to the United Kingdom. And uh, it really showed you how much girls really wanted an education how open-minded the families were, not to just say the woman's place is in the home, she's not gonna be educated, she's just gonna get married and that's it. No, the fathers, the mothers, the brothers, they encouraged the girls in the family to have um, a good education career-wise. Uh, Bahraini women started receiving master's degrees since the 40s, from the 1940s. Um, and we had uh, in our march towards development with our reform project of from 1999, when His Majesty ascended the throne, we had a specialized council on higher education. And we also had, we achieved in 2010, the United Nations goal for universal uh, primary education and gender equality. We ranked first among many countries with the world performance in education, according to UNESCO. Um, and when we come to the health sector, for example, 66% of Bahraini female today are doctors. Uh, we had the first female doctor graduated in 1969. Uh, we had qualified Bahraini nurses in 1941, uh, first uh, nursing schools in 1959, and then between 1960s and 1970s, you had nurses traveling on missions abroad. Uh, we had the first nurse graduated in 1978 from the University of Baghdad, and um, we had the first Bahraini nurse in the Defense Force um, also in the 70s. And we had female Minister of Health. Today, our current Minister of Health is also a woman. So it just shows you how wonderful they're able to excel in, in certain sectors. And uh, as we spoke before about Bahraini women and politics, uh, and I mentioned about the National Assembly, today we've got five women who hold elected seats. We've got nine women in the appointed chamber. Um, women entered government. Today we have a female who's um, a royal court special envoy of His Majesty. Uh, we had uh, a female ambassador first appointed uh, as an ambassador to Paris in 99. We had a female ambassador to China, to UK. The one in UK was also of Christian faith. My cousin Jewish was in Washington. Um, but overall, uh, we had also women going in the judicial authority. They became judges. They became head of uh, courts of uh, constitu constitutional court. But overall, we have also the, the uh, push from the Supreme Council for Women. And um, this uh, is, is, a, is a wonderful institution that, uh, that supports women in various ways. Uh, we have an award in the name of our First Lady, the wife of His Majesty. Uh, it's an award for the advancement of women. Uh, it, it's granted to the various institution that prepare women in the administrative grounds, supporting them. Uh, and this year, actually, on the 1st of December is Bahraini Women's Day. And the theme for this year is uh, the women in the field of diplomatic work. So we have the first woman in the Gulf region in Bahrain, who is appointed as the uh, uh, undersecretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So we have a lot of achievements. And when you look at uh, public private sector, today uh, the Bahraini women uh, in the government sector, we're very proud of this, our civil service bureau, 
uh, the, their board has established equal opportunities committee, meaning every government organization has this committee that looks into the needs of the women, ensuring that they all have equality, uh, whether it's in training, scholarship, career advancement, and they take into account all, all their needs. Um, in private sector, for example, women worked as employees since the 1950s. So women were career oriented. Uh, they became uh, in the field of entrepreneurship in the 1960s. Uh, today, they hold commercial registrations. No one is telling them you're not allowed to as a female. They, they are they are their own companies, their chief executive officers, their managers of banks. And we've had a list of them in the Forbes Middle East uh, among the most uh, powerful women, uh, Arab women. Uh, today, they're also members of the board of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've got pilot officer. Uh, we're very proud of her. She's the first Bahraini female to graduate from Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy. Um, and she flies a, a Hawk trainer. We've had women in police force uh, since the 1970s. Um, and uh, just to highlight the importance, because we established our women police force way back then. And the state of Kuwait in 2008 sought the guidance of my country to establish their women police force. So it's something that we're very proud of. Today, we have women police personnel acting as advisors to the minister, head of public security for community affairs, etc. So I tell you, um, you know, women today have come a yeah. long way. And uh, we're very thankful for that. This is very impressive overview. Thank you so much. You know, every person on this call was uh, and still is extremely excited uh, because of the signing of the normalization agreements. And uh, it should be noted that there was no belligerency between Israel and Bahrain. The only reason a normalization agreement was needed is because there was a, a state of boycott, economic boycott between the entire Arab League and the state of Israel. So therefore, and normalization agreements are needed with all Arab countries. How is the normalization agreement accept people of Bahrain? What can you tell us about the way it was received? Uh, well, to be honest, the moment we heard about this announcement, it was really a great surprise. Uh, it was met with great excitement um, and people of Bahrain believe that it'll bring in greater strength, stability, prosperity for the region. And we must remember that the state of Israel never posed a threat to the Gulf countries or the region. And indeed, seven decades of lost opportunity is a very long time. So now, as we say, everything in Hashem's time. So now it's written for it to have happened. And, um, and everybody really met it with great excitement. I mean, His Majesty is praised for embracing religious diversity. The coexistence that we have is really a role model in our country. And, uh, and we believe that there'll be greater uh, prosperity. And also both countries we feel will, will benefit. Wonderful. I, let me ask you one last question before I turn to the audience because we are flooded here with questions. Um, um, what should Israelis expect from this newly developed relationships and what should the Bahraini people expect? Um, in my opinion, I believe that Israel will benefit by having a new trading partner. Um, we know that Israel is very famous when it comes to technology and many, many sectors. So indeed, uh, they will have great trading potential. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, that Bahrain has always been the center for international commerce as well. Um, and I feel with the respective memoranda of understanding being signed or to be signed further between the respective counterparts, uh, I believe that there'll be joint collaboration in many aspects. In fact, when we were talking about my book, 
I mean, I feel, I mean, I'd be very excited if they would be a joint collaboration between Bahraini screenwriters and Israeli producers. By the because, way, do you, do you yeah. have a, a copy of the book? Can you show us the That's book? That's why I was going to mention, this is actually the first edition. I know you had asked me to have one at hand. This is, if you can see, it was on oral history. It was like 120 pages only. It was all mainly uh, verbal from the older generation. Very soon after that, a year later, you can see the thickness of the volume. This was the revised and updated edition of the book. And uh, why I, I mention this is because it, in um, this Ramadan, which was the holy month of fasting for the Muslim people, um, the, I had Bahraini screenwriters, I collaborated with them. This lady was a very famous Jewish midwife. Her name was Ruth Moses. And they wrote about, it was, a, it was a, a series, a social cohesion series about way of life in the Gulf in the 1940s. And I'm very proud to have been a dynamic force to help them in the Jewish um, you know, matters related to the script. Um, and they've actually gone to a bag, the, um, the, uh, it's called the eighth annual America Media Awards, AAM uh, in Washington. So I think it's around this week. So now, I personally this... feel not only in technology, but even in script writing in actors in, uh, you know, it, you can have Israeli actors come to Bahrain and act as well and, and produce a documentary, vice versa, uh, in the arts, um, a lot of tourism. So I think in many aspects. Yeah, I, I, and there's a great deal of, of, of curiosity and enthusiasm on the part of the Israeli media. You just mentioned uh, the midwife, Ruth Moses. I think that yes. in Arabic, yeah. she was referred to as uh, Um Harun, right? Um Harun. Correct. They just took her, um, you know, her character, her costume, her profession. But again, it was always also mixed with the imagination of the screenwriters. And it was a groundbreaking series. It was amazing. So I think we'll have a lot of collaboration in, in many areas. Wonderful. So we have a very long list of questions. People are really <laughs> interested about Jewish life in Bahrain, which is really fascinating. So Israel Man is asking, where do young people find their spouses for marriage in Bahrain? Well, uh, you see, uh, in the old days, they used to kind of intermarry uh, between the families that they know. Uh, over the years, yes, it did become more difficult. You had cases of intermarriage as well. Uh, and then, of course, they would travel outbound, meet their spouses in UK, in the States, any other country, and then come back with their spouse if they decide to uh, start a family in Bahrain or would uh, go and settle abroad if they wanted to uh, follow their spouse um, outbound. So this is the history, how it goes. Interesting. Michael Salman is asking, is curious about as to why the Bahraini government and culture has been so tolerant to Jews um, for, so, for so long. Uh, is there any explanation as to why that particular culture has been so tolerant to Jews? It's a beautiful question. I think because, uh, you know, the leadership have been very open minded. This comes from the grandparents of our current king and it goes from generation to generation. So I'd say it's the open mindedness of our of our ruling family. That's one, the Al Khalifa family. Uh, I'd also put it down to um, uh, Islam uh, them being Muslims as well, a Muslim leadership. Islam as a religion teaches coexistence, teaches peace, teaches respect for one another. So uh, that in itself, I think they have embraced the true values of being Muslim to embrace people. Like for example, not only the Jewish people, I think uh, the, the gentleman who asked the question would be also fascinated to know, we've got churches, we've got a Hindu crematorium, uh, you know, no other country in the Gulf would have a, a crematorium, uh, although in Islam and Judaism we bury, we don't burn the body, but out of respect even for, for people of other uh, di religious diversity, uh, they, they all have their places of worship. So this really shows the, um, the peacefulness and coexistence and embrace of the leadership. We all admire your great articulation and your phenomenal language, your phenomenal English. So Gloria Fenster is, is asking, she wants to know, where, would you, where were you educated? Thank you very much. I tend to speak too much as a woman as well. I'm never lost for words. But uh, I was educated in Bahrain uh, at the Sacred Heart School. It was a Roman Catholic convent school. 
and um, I was the only Jewish student there. And we had a British curriculum, so maybe that's why I used to go every year to London. Uh, my mom's uh, siblings mainly were based in London. We used to go there, and my father's siblings were based in the States. So sometimes I, I feel I don't have much of an accent, but uh, but mo mainly because of the uh, British curriculum that, that I studied that, And then I went to London for higher education as well. Now, Paula Blistein is uh, curious about the relationship between the Jewish community of Bahrain and the Jewish community of, of the UAE. And she would like to uh, mention that uh, as a proud Canadian, that the chief rabbi of UAE, uh, my dear colleague and friend from New York University, Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, um, is from Montreal. And now he's living in New York, but he's originally from Montreal. And uh, the question is, is there any relationship? Does he travel? Does the community connect from Abu Dhabi and Dubai with uh, Manama? Good Manama. question. Actually, currently with the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, I haven't met respect to rabbis from UAE. They haven't visited Manama. Um, and neither have we really had opportunity to go to UAE to, to, to see them. But I have had the opportunity to meet with um, Ross Kreil, who's the president, I understand, of the community, uh, through one of the World Jewish Congress forums that we had during the summer months, uh, immediately after the uh, naturalization, normalization uh, accord was signed. And uh, I've been in touch with him, uh, contacted him, put him in touch with certain people here, restaurants, uh, if they wanted to become uh, co-share or different things like that. But we do have each other's numbers, but I understand that I think they also have um, much of a responsibility for their own community. Um, and I know that they're one of the closest to us because we're just 45 minutes away by flight. And it would be wonderful to have opportunity to meet with them. But really, honestly, this year, we haven't had any opportunity for that. Right. We will wait post-crisis, post-COVID, and uh, we will be more than happy from Jerusalem and from Toronto and Montreal and New York to help you facilitate those relationships. Um, Thank you. Judy Franklin is, is curious about the ties between Bahrain and the rest of the region. If you could just give us a quick overview as to the diplomatic ties between Bahrain and the rest of the countries in the Gulf region. Sure. I mean, the Kingdom of Bahrain is known to be a very peaceful and friendly uh, country. Uh, we have good friendly relations with, with all the countries, I can say. Um, the, the Gulf uh, region, uh, you have uh, comprises of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, Sultanate of um, Oman, uh, and you've got uh, State of Kuwait, uh, State of Qatar, and the Kingdom of Bahrain. These six countries comprise of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Um, and uh, we have very good relations. So we have a bridge that links us from Bahrain to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, and we have uh, daily flights, we have good trade. Uh, Saudi Arabia really is seen to be the mother country of all the countries here in the Gulf region or for the Muslim world in general, because it has the Holy Kaaba where they go for their pilgrimage. So it's really seen as the mother country. And um, we, we have uh, very good relations. We have many of the Gulf national students uh, studying here also at the University of Bahrain. We have international students also coming from abroad, like we've got the American University of Bahrain, the Royal University for Women, um, and uh, they, they travel to and fro. So it's not really necessarily only for trade and commerce, but you also have for education, uh, for health, for example, as well. Um, um, so overall, we have, uh, we have good relations. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. David Stambler is asking again about women's status in Bahrain. Uh, given all the tremendous strides that the Kingdom of Bahrain uh, had made in recent decades, uh, where do you still need? Where do you still see a need for improvement? Are there any areas for growth? Is there any room to grow for women in Bahrain? 
there's always um, uh, room to, to grow and to improve and to excel definitely uh, in any sector. Um, and also when it comes to women advancement as well, uh, there's always much to learn every day, you know, uh, and it's good to see how well we can cooperate uh, together in all sectors with people, how to help them to bring awareness. So I think it just depends on, on the actual say subject matter at hand that would be there that we'd feel that we'd need to have a bit more improvement uh, or, or a bit better reform in, in, in certain areas. I mean, for example, uh, as a legislator myself, we always look at improving our legislation, uh, be it in, in, in various sectors. So like today we were discussing um, a law that would improve on the uh, child protection uh, laws, for example. Uh, there's always room for, for improvement and rooms to see how we can always acknowledge women's needs and downstream them in legislation and to the various sectors. And as I said, we have Equal Opportunities Committee that would see where those little gaps are and make sure they, um, they, they accelerate it from there. Wonderful. And um, uh, Tsipora is asking um, if you have family in Israel, if you've ever been to Israel. I haven't personally been to Israel because we never really had open diplomatic relations until recently. And as a law-abiding citizen of my country, I can visit a country which doesn't have open ties. Um, I don't have immediate family living there. Uh, some of my cousins do from their paternal paternal side, uh, but I did hear of a, of a very famous Rabbi Kuduri that people say could have been related somehow along the family tree. Uh, but but we do meet people, um, you know, when we travel a lot and go on various delegations, you do meet uh, people who are from Israel and you establish um, a connection or by email, etc. But uh, but we've never visited, no. All but right, so I can tell future. you that that the Hebrew University is, uh, you know, is waiting for you. And we're Thank very you. happy, and uh, I can promise you, um, on behalf of my dear friend Rami Kleiman and Manette Malevsky, the, the fearless leaders of Canadian Friends, that we will be more than happy to take you to see the um, archives of Albert Einstein at the Hebrew Thank University. You. And Ellen Weiss is asking about the normalization agreements. If you could share with us a little bit about the background. Obviously, um, there's a question, did it really start with the current US administration or the outgoing US administration, or was it in the making uh, for a long time? Well, I tell you what, in, in my personal opinion, um, it, was, it was trying to work itself out, but special thanks definitely goes to President Donald Trump to Jared Kushner, to the White House team, because they were very instrumental in, in working at this and many visits going to and fro. And, you know, sometimes these meetings are also not held openly. But we did have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Peace to Prosperity workshop where we had a lot of people visit here. Uh, and it was talking about more of the economic development, how, how um, you know, once say peace and normalization comes about. I mean, I wouldn't say peace because Israel was never at war with the Gulf countries, but we let's say a normalization um, uh, accord. Um, I would say that, um, we were looking at a good economic development. You had a lot of serious businessmen sitting there from all over the Gulf countries talking business, you know, sitting there talking, laying the foundation, seeing what they want. They had a beautiful map, you know, a beautiful blueprint there envisioned uh, for, um, for the Palestinian people as well that would pour into their benefit too uh, once uh, the, this normalization comes about. But I would say it, it once it accelerated with the signing ceremony in September, uh, definitely a uh, special thanks goes to the Trump administration for it. Special thanks to our leadership. Uh, the UAE was, of course, the first to accelerate it. You've had peace agreements before with Egypt, Jordan, etc. But for the Gulf in particular, UAE took the first step and uh, then came Bahrain, then after it, of course, Sudan in the region. And uh, I am sure, I am sure uh, with great confidence that once other countries see how there is prosperity and how both countries are actually progressing and finding it uh, a good and amicable and moving forward in a serious way, I believe that other countries will follow. 
Uh, both um, Alice Budlovsky, uh, who's interested in whether Jews are allowed to travel outside of Bahrain, and, um, and I believe uh, Glenda Convoy was, in, was asking about whether Jews can keep kosher in Bahrain. They're both interested in the practical side of doing lo Jewish life in Bahrain. Can well, you travel when it comes, and yeah. can you keep kosher? Kosher. So when it comes to traveling, yes, we have freedom here in the country. We're allowed to travel everywhere. Apart from what I said, if there is a country that doesn't have diplomatic ties, we don't go. But um, but uh, traveling, yes, we, we're allowed to go. Uh, we get the visas if we need visas. If we don't need, it's fine. It, it depends on the country. Uh, so, and actually Bahrainis are quite well known that they love to travel. It's like they just want to increase their days off and they take their, their um, holidays from work and they always like to go to a different country that they've never been to. So Bahrainis are travelers. Um, and as for keeping uh, kosher, we are not uh, highly religious as a community. We're not very ultra orthodox, but we're more traditional conservative. We keep the high holidays, we keep what we can. Uh, so we've never really uh, had the supermarket sell uh, kosher products. Although over the years, we used to find the box of Rakusen matzah uh, on the shelves as well. And we used to, we used to recognize it. Um, we used to always bring our share products. Uh, we used to import it from London, like before Passover. I used to ask uh, like a rabbi in London from the Lubavitch to please arrange for me the boxes and everything. And I used to bring. Uh, we have one, one family, one home here uh, that, that keeps kosher. So they, they import their meats. There is no restriction. I mean, it's all religious. And even when I bring my kosher uh, foods uh, for Pesach, uh, when I speak with the Ministry of Health and when I speak to the airport customs, um, there's always the highest level of collaboration to serve, to make sure it's um, cleared in, in, uh, in um, target time and there's, there's never any obstacles. So we import, but now, with the uh, normalization accord, we had one person come from the States a couple of weeks ago, speaking with the leading hotels, um, the Ritz-Carlton, the Four Seasons, and even the Ritz-Carlton advertised openly that it is the first hotel in the country to, to have or to offer a kosher uh, food and have a kosher menu. I think he came and he supervised the kitchens, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, again, you know, uh, how big will the demand be? For example, years ago, if you had very orthodox or very strict religious people visiting Bahrain, they would bring their respective canned foods or whatever they wanted. Or if they came to our homes, it is okay. We would do vegetarian or fish. Uh, and I remember when we had the intercivil dialogue, intercivilization conference, um, a rabbi uh, from the Spanish Portuguese visited from London and I ensured at the hotel, I'd go in, I'd tell the chef, make sure you cook in foil. So he'd make fish and we'd serve it on foil. And we made sure that all of us who sat at the table ate uh, in, had the food also cooked in foil for us to not make him feel uh, any different. Uh, because we respect that, of course. So there are dietary restrictions. Uh, but I think now it will become more easier. I understand a lot of supermarket owners are having uh, discussions with people in the States and London all over to, to bring in kosher products. So I think we're going to have kosher yeah. needs here very soon. I think it makes sense because you're going to have so many Israelis who keep kosher coming to uh, Bahrain very soon. Yes. Uh, yes. They're on their way, I can tell you. They're buying the ticket right now. One last question. They're welcome. Please. I'll turn it over <laughs> to our dear friend, Stephen Lipper, to uh, conclude the program. People are asking, where can they buy your book? Because they're already looking for it online and they can't, <laughs> some people say they can't find it. Where can we find your book? It, was, it, it can't be found at the moment, you know, this is just a copy I keep to refer to uh, for make any, any references. Um, currently, it's uh, out of stock. It used to be sold mainly in Bahrain in a leading bookshop called Jeshin Mal Bookshop uh, and also in the branches at the airport of Bahrain and in one shop uh, in London called Divery Kodesh in Edgware. 
But over the years, I understand it's uh, it's just gone out of stock as well. But uh, I assure you that once it comes back into into print, I'll let you know, and uh, you let me know how many were interested in the book and where they can find it, and I'll keep you updated as to because this would be the new book. This would be the one they're looking for, the revised and updated edition. And I thank them for their interest. Uh, but uh, I'm happy to send you like a, a PDF. Um, uh, which I use like for before I publish the book. Uh, if somebody would just like to read it for their personal interest and not, uh, you know, send it around and circulate it, uh, just to read it like from their computer, I'm happy to to share that with you to circulate. Thank to you, them. thank with you pleasure. so much with for pleasure. your, thank you so much for your generous offer and um, and thank you for again this phenomenal conversation we've had. Yeah. People were glued to the screen, and uh, I'd like to turn to our dear friend and leader, Stephen Lipper from Montreal, to, co to conclude the program. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, Ambassador Edu Aharoni. Special thanks to um, our dear brothers, uh, Rami Kleinman um, and His Excellencies V. Hauser as well uh, for this wonderful opportunity and your dynamic team behind the scene. I think it's Ayala, if I pronounce it correctly, and Dina as well. And, uh, you know, they've, they've been phenomenal. Thank you so much for making this possible. Thank you. So, Nancy, if I may call you Nancy, uh, may I also add our joint thanks to uh, the Hebrew University, the Canadian Friends of the Hebrew University, uh, for arranging this event and co-sponsoring it together with Congregation Shar HaShemayim. And my thanks go to Robin Bennett and Rabbi Adam Shire for their support of this program. Um, I also do want to thank the ambassador who has been carrying on these interviews on a regular Sunday basis, and he brings his great knowledge and expertise to these programs. So thank you, ambassador. And uh, to you, Nancy, what can I say? You know, we were looking forward to this conversation with great, great anticipation. For us, the Abraham Accords were a dream. Uh, we also, we're surprised with joy to see this breakthrough uh, with the Arab world, and it is a breakthrough, and we only hope and pray uh, that it will expand to other countries of your Gulf Council, uh, because this is so important, not only for Israel, but also for our Ab Arab neighbors to change the course of history now and to work together, all as children of Abraham. And um, having met you today, um, it was hard for us to believe when we were introduced to the fact that there was a Jewish member of the Shura. Uh, <laughs> and now we see the Jewish member in the flesh. She is <laughs> beautiful, charming, and speaks English better than we do. It's a, it's a fantastic <laughs> thing. So you are a marvelous representative of your country. You are a marvelous representative of your Jewish community. And you are a hope to all of us, and we hope to see much more of you, uh, that with your leadership and with whatever support we can give you, that these Abraham Accords will strengthen and widen, and we look forward to that day. So we wish you every good luck, every bit of mazal uh, to achieve ever greater uh, relationships between the Gulf and Israel, which will be a blessing to all of us and I think all of humanity. Thank you Thank so, you. so much. Amen to that. Thank you so much. Amen to that as well. Thank you.